Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of GRWM, Get Reporting With Me. Surprise, I'm not alone this time. It's not just me. I have the amazing and brilliant Dr. Yvette Grossman here from Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. She's one of my very good friends and collaborators in the world of gynae ultrasound and one of our co-founders of the Gynae Ultrasound Society of North America. So welcome, Yvette. Thank you. What a nice introduction. And just to let people know, there's no baby crying in the background. You might hear a cat. <laughs> Wonderful. So I will uh, share the screen. Uh, and we'll go through a case for the viewers. Uh, Dr. Grossman has not seen these pictures, doesn't know anything about this case, is going to be very pure, uh, like what happens in her office day to day, reviewing images and videos of patients that come in for various reasons. I'll give you a little bit of background. We have a 42 year old and, uh, and the patient has had a scan elsewhere with possible endometrioma. And uh, then there is a, a desire to evaluate for endometriosis more thoroughly. Okay. Sounds good. I'm, I'm ready. Let's begin. Okay. Image number, one. Image number one. Here we go. So my, uh, my approach is always to take a few trans abdominal pictures to ensure that we're capturing the lay of the land. In this case, uh, really, in, in the context of endometriosis, we'll be looking for large pathology, for example, a large endometrioma, a large fibroid. And so, yeah, in this very uh, easy still image, nothing jumping out at us, right? Nope, not yet. And I, I agree that we also, um, in my practice, start transabdominally. I mean, sometimes you'll see a, a uterus that's like bent in half and you already know something's going on. Back yeah, there. it can give you like a pretty quick, oh, okay, there's, you know, there's something big going on and we need to go into it with a bit more of a detective mode. Yeah. So let's scan through some of these TA pictures. I'll go quickly through them because I don't think that there's a whole lot of value here, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe we're mm -hmm. starting to get a bit Something's of a going on there. Yep. Something's so, there. Cystic lesion there for sure. Left head nexa, nothing dramatic, some vessels. Yeah. Back to uterus and transverse, yeah. mm -hmm. fine. Not a very useful uh, cine loop there, so we'll buzz right by yeah. it. There's that right at Nexa again in transverse. Something cystic going on there, yep. Okay. <clears throat> Left side, okay. Now we're getting to the money, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, so here we go with uh, our sag uterus. So. Uh, this one's, you know, more for the metrics here. We have a uterus me measures roughly 90 by 41. Are you using millimeters or centimeters? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, we use millimeters. Right. Yeah. I think uh, to me that makes the most sense because you get a little bit more granularity out of it, especially as you start to measure small things and staying in millimeters the whole time makes my mind more at ease than flipping between centimeters yeah. and millimeters. Yeah, I highly recommend staying with one uh one measurement system, not system, but yeah, not flipping back and forth between centimeters and millimeters. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll skip through and we'll go to the cine loop. So we have a, a cine loop sagittal of the uterus and okay. I'll, gonna, I'll stop talking and I'll see, uh, hopefully you see this in okay quality here. What yeah, yeah. Think? No, it's great. Um, all right. So the first thing, first thing I always look for um, in someone who we are suspecting endometriosis is the uterine orientation. Um, how, because a lot of times right away, you'll know if the uterus is in a really unusual uh, orientation, uh, such as anaverted and retroflexed, or sometimes it'll even be like, it looks like an upside down candy cane. I don't know. Do you have candy canes in Canada? Oh yeah. Winter. Okay. Us. Yeah. So you know that something is tethering it in the back. So I'm not noticing that here. This is a pretty normal anaverted looking uterus. Um, I am noticing uh, little cysts in the myometrium. 
Uh, I would turn color on. I would use a uh, Doppler to make sure that they're not little vessels. But yes, right there. I see that little cyst there. Mm -hmm. doesn't look like a vessel to me, but you would definitely want to check it with color. Um, and I'm also seeing fan-shaped shadowing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. As, uh, can... as I explained in one of the earlier episodes, you can see a lot when the cine is playing, but sometimes slowing it down actually gives you a little bit more control because then you have your hand on the on the cursor, you can go kind yeah. of back and forth and, and stay on something. Do you do the same in your practice? Yeah, definitely. Um, and especially we have residents um, and fellows that rotate uh, to do gyne ultrasound and I definitely slow it way down. Mm -hmm. um, but also the other thing that you can see here now that you stopped it is you can see the little lines. Yep, little lines coming off of the endometrium mm -hmm. here buds and lines, um, another marker. So the little cyst that you showed earlier, right and then there. these little, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to show with my cursor, but you'll, but you see these, yep, exactly. So yeah. both of those are direct signs of adenomyosis. Yeah, um, for sure. So in this case, it, it's pretty slam dunk in my mind that this is, uh, adenomyosis. The, there's a lot of interesting dialogue in adenomyosis around inter-observer agreement. Do you see what I see and do I see what you see? Are we on the same page? And for sure, I totally am on the same page as you here. Um, the other thing that there's a lot of controversy on is the severity. So tell me a little bit about your report. Do you simply list the features you see? Do you count them? Do you try and qualify that at all with uh, the words mild, moderate, severity, what do you do? That's that's a really good question. Um, we actually had a Grand Rounds at Brigham Women's today where they were talking about adenomyosis. Um, well, unfortunately, there's no staging system yet, right? So um, the biggest problem we've had with adenomyosis has been that there's been no standardized language. So the studies were very poor because everyone used different terms. Now that we finally have some standardized language based on the MUSA criteria that people are using, um, I think we're going to be able to do good studies. But first, we have to standardize the terms and agree which criteria are actually valid, I feel, before we can actually uh, stage things. So I don't tend to put classifiers such as mild, moderate, or severe, unless... I mean, sometimes you have a uterus that's double its size and it has cysts everywhere. And it's just a, a beginner would see it, obviously, that it's abnormal. But usually I'll just uh, list the features. I'll say, for example, in this case, I would say um, there are the following direct features of adenomyosis, myometrial cysts, um, endometrial, subendometrial lines and buds, um, indirect feature of fan-shaped shadowing, but I wouldn't classify as mild, moderate, or severe because who knows what that is? I, I, How about I, you? Totally the same. And actually we, we have never had a true, true in-depth granular conversation about this. So uh, so for people who are watching, you know, this is not pre-scripted. I'm on the exact same page. When people see my reports, there will be the occasional time where I will say this is severe. And part of that is uh, a desire to really hammer home the importance of that diagnosis, in particular, if somebody is having tremendous abnormal bleeding or in the context of fertility, because mm -hmm. adenomyosis, unfortunately, is one of those things that we really don't have great treatment options for from a fertility standpoint at this time. So I really want the patient to know and I want the referring provider to know that this might be an actually a more challenging case to overcome since it is much more glaringly obvious sonographically. So uh, yeah. so I'm on the exact same page. Most of the time it's just listing of features. And then occasionally I will provide a little bit of color to that. If it's uh, lots more severe, if it's one spot, I might say this is very subtle or mild adenomyosis in particular in younger individuals who we might yeah. be seeing the earliest signs of it. Yeah, or focal. Like I had a case yesterday where literally the patient had one hyperechogenic island and the rest looked beautiful. And 
that I said is focal, but usually I don't specify. Yeah, same. And uh, so focal and focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium is usually mm -hmm. uh, described in a, I would say, more refined way with measurements and some associated endometriosis features there as well. So what okay. do you think about the posterior there? Do you think there's a focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium, right? Yep, right where you're... Right here? Yep. I think there, we're just seeing a bit of hypoechogenicity from okay. vessels, probably the arcuate vessels there. I don't uh, I don't think that this case there is any FAOM, yeah. focal adenomyosis of the outer myometrium. I think that this is diffuse adeno, actually, as the uh, junctional zone, uh, almost from cornua to cornua and the entirety of the anterior and posterior actually seems to be affected. So I think mm -hmm. this is diffuse, yeah. but it's not uh, whereby we're seeing uh, significant muscular hypertrophy with mm -hmm. globular shape uterus. Maybe there is some asymmetry here, right? Yeah. Posterior does look yeah, a, little a little bit, bit. more. So, uh, and there we go. The sonographer has, yeah. uh, has had that... Um, mindset as well. So we do have a uh, asymmetry identified as well. Which is an indirect sign. Yes. And you can see that without any other signs. And, and when it's seen without any other signs, I usually don't describe it. I would usually say there may be a, a, even a contraction present uh, so that it's mm -hmm. not misleading for people. Yeah. All right. Scanning through the uterus and transverse. We won't belabor adenomyosis too much because We've already had uh, probably at least one or maybe more episodes with some features, but in the transverse here, we've got some really good echogenic lines, buds, yep. irregularity of that junctional zone, yep. really clear visualization of that. Yeah. Yep. Now, I think this is a great case for people who are wanting to learn about adenomyosis, um, because this is a nice example, not nice for the patient, obviously. When it's nice for us, it's never nice for the patient. Yeah, but this absolutely. is a really good example showing uh, some direct signs, which for beginners, you have to learn them. It, they're pretty subtle. Yeah, and you have to be very um, intentional about it. They're not just going to jump out at you. You have to intentionally... Let's uh, dismiss that. Sorry about that. Uh, let's say that again and I'll try and cut. Okay. With adenomyosis, especially those direct features, you have to be very intentional about trying to find them. You can't just assume that they're going to be so obvious and jump out at you. So in my mind, I actually have a structured list and I go through that list every time I'm looking at a uterus. If they jump out at me, then fine, you know, check mark. But otherwise I, I go through that list. Are there myometriosis? Are there subendometriosis? echogenic lines and buds, because I want to be systematic. I want to make sure I'm thinking about it in every single case. So yeah. I think that's yeah. the approach to take, especially whether you're a beginner or an advanced person, systematic approaches are essential. Yep. Yep. All I right. Totally so we've gone to the right over here. What do we see? Yeah. So uh, it looks like it's a multilocular cyst because I, I think there's a septation on the transverse plane right there. We'd have to go through it, but it looks like that's a septation. Um, so if it's a septation, it would be a multilocular cyst with, um, and that's, that's an option too. Like sometimes sonographers will ask me, should I measure it as one or two? Um, I don't think there is, there's no textbook correct answer. Um, sometimes I'll say if you can really make it look like two separate measure it as two but otherwise you could measure this either way you can measure it as one multilocular cyst with you can either report it as ground glass echoes or um, homogeneous low level echoes um, there's a very classic thing which actually i was just discussing with our fellow um, who's rotating with us today those hyper echoic little both side there's a little right there that you often will see in endometriomas. Yeah, can you go back to that? There's a little bright white line. Where is it? There it is. Right? Don't you? Those are really common. Do you? Yeah. What are those? Okay, is it hemosiderin? So, uh, honestly, uh, this is a puzzle for me. So, in uh, in the context of scanning and operating, scanning and operating, I've been really exploring this. Uh, 
type of sonographic feature. And we mm -hmm. sometimes see them in totally normal ovaries at the periphery. Yes. And surgically, there is often uh, abnormalities on the surface of the ovary, but not so classic endometriosis abnormalities. Sometimes it's the mm -hmm. Uh, more vesicular type, so clear, almost like a distortion of the uh, outer cortex of the ovary. And so I, in some cases, I biopsy these and we've had endometriosis come back histopathologically. In other cases, we haven't had any abnormalities identified. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's frustrating for me. Because, but you see it with endo, yeah, right? Like, it, yes. like sometimes if I'm not sure if something's a hemorrhagic cyst, we had this discussion today. Um, or if it's an endometrioma, because sometimes endometriomas can have internal hemorrhage and you'll see a little clot. But when you see those, that's an endometrioma, right? Don't you think so? Or Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking more about these hyperechoic foci in the context of a normal ovary with peripheral hyperechogenicity that makes me wonder if there's surface superficial endometriosis. Yeah. I, uh, to be honest with you, I haven't really been considering them that much in the context of an endometrioma, because for me, it's already at least in this. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's classic, that, that is, yeah, that right? one. Plus, we right. have the, the history that this patient had a, an endometrioma-like cyst on a community ultrasound already. So uh, it's, um, in, it's persistent, right? If it yeah. was uh, the first time I was scanning a patient and I had the differential of hemorrhagic cyst in my brain then uh, then I might want other features, but I haven't actually thought about that. So thanks, I, I will start to-, to Yeah, you'll see. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, so, and in, in this case too, you have that kind of thickened anterior wall. If you go back to the prior image, yeah, right there, yep. The mm -hmm. anterior wall, which you also see in endometriomas, right? Sometimes you see that, that thickened rim. Right there? Yep. And then uh, in the image before, let's see, the one that was the multilocular. Yep, go an uh, anterior. Nope, go back. Go anterior. Go back. Yep. Video? You know how they describe a thick, often you'll have like a thickened wall. Mm -hmm. Here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, Here. do we know what that is? Is that just blood? Like... Sorry, this cat is having an attack of love. You're having cats jumping into your screen and I'm yes. having these little focus having, sessions yeah. jumping into the screen. Yeah. The This is still early episodes, viewers. So yeah, yeah, it's we'll fine. We'll better. get more. But um, actually, let, let's record that part because that is so common, that thick, which some people think is solid. They get scared. Yeah, it's just the ovary. This is just the yeah. ovary surrounding it. And actually, for me yeah. as a surgeon, this is uh, often a, a more reassuring finding because I want to know that if I'm oh, yeah, there's a little follicle. There is yep. residual yep. ovary, yep. right? Yeah, when, when you can't see any ovary. Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> what are all your little warning signs? I know it's so annoying. Is it from the university? It's because I have Citrix open. I'm going to have to do a lot of post-processing editing on this one. <laughs> um, well, do you want to just go back and review? No, no. The, okay. I'll edit. I'll edit. Yeah, um, yeah this is the, the feature of that thicker wall around. That's ovary. And for me, okay. that's reassuring. That is evidence okay. of normal ovarian tissue. And when yeah. you see follicles, that's even more reassuring. I actually... Uh, see a lot of people who have fertility desires, right? And yeah. if they have endometriomas and we're thinking about surgery and we see that ovarian cortex with follicles, I'm reassured that they will probably do better surgically. But mm -hmm. in the event that they pursue oocyte stimulation and retrieval preoperatively, they actually will have more substantial ovarian cortex where there's going to be a source of follicles present than those stretched out endometriomas with very thin yeah. around them. Right, right. All right, yeah. so we got two endometriomas here. I agree. There's no solid components. There's no yeah. abnormal Doppler vascularity. Oh, As per no. IOTA, simple rules, benign, right? Yep, yep. As per IOTA, easy or benign descriptors, they're endometriomas. So we know what they yep. are. And we can call them that. We don't have to use the word, the bad word, which is? 
complex. Oh, terrible. Ugh. Chest pain, I, that word is It's used. just painful. Okay, so we we'll move Kevin. on from the ovary. Well, not quite. We're, uh, we're starting to implement yes. some dynamic tests right now, which are uh, yes. ovarian mobility assessment. Yes. So you see oh. on the left of screen, there's a hand, right? You almost yep. can see the hand pop into the pelvis right there. Yeah. So you're pushing like a bimanual exam, right? You're pushing gently on the abdomen. Yep. I do that exactly. too. And so, so it looks like it's sliding nicely from the pelvic side wall there. Yeah. Right where the iliac is, it's moving, but that's actually also where the normal ovary is, right? So that kind of mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. Where the cyst gets thinner is along the uh, inferior aspect along the uterine. So this is the uterine region here. So this is the pelvic side while lower. This is the pelvic side while a little bit higher up next to the iliacs where uh, um, it's just higher up in the pelvis. And I think it's stuck here. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see. I think ovarian mobility is really challenging. It is for sure. Um, it's one yeah. of the harder, it's one of the harder dynamic things to do. There's a lot of dialogue around the endometriosis ultrasound and how people can adopt certain things. There's uh, there's always been this undercurrent of the sliding sign is really easy to do. I think it's not the hardest thing to do, but I think there is a lot of nuance and it can be quite hard. Yeah. But the ovaries, I, I because agree. people see those all the time and they think, oh, I can find the ovary so I can assess the mobility of it. I think we're, we're uh, underestimating the complexity of this particular dynamic test. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I see people who are just starting out. Um, sometimes they'll, they'll think it's moving and then I show it to them. I'm like, it's not moving. Do you see these things are stretching, but it's not moving past mm -hmm. and it's a pretty subtle. I think that is definitely something that you need experience to, to get good at. Yeah. We should be delicate in the um, interpretation of ovarian mobility or immobility, yeah. particularly in early days of endometriosis imaging, because we don't, we don't really want to overcall or undercall things. There's a lot of mm -hmm. significance to the diagnosis of endo. In this case, of course, we have a clear diagnosis already, but yeah. uh, it would be not super great if we had a totally normal ovary that was considered immobile, maybe giving somebody the impression of endometriosis or adhesions when in fact it's not present at all. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, Definitely. let's keep going. All right, we got our left ovary here and uh, we don't really need to talk too much about the left ovary in my opinion. You let me know uh, if you think there's anything we need to talk about here. Nope. I think it looks okay. Good that follicles as fine. well. Yep. Reassuring. And then yep. uh, from a mobility standpoint, so my sonographer here kind of flipped in this recording from uh, SAGE to transverse pretty quickly. Maybe that's not the greatest technique. Maybe we should do SAG views, then transverse views. But um, with endometriosis ultrasound, I'm usually either in the room or right next door. So we're doing a lot of real time, in real time interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. Because in this one, I can't tell if it's moving from the sidewall. It's mm -hmm. not being pushed enough. It doesn't look like it's adhered to the uterus, but maybe I'm just not, from that clip, I wouldn't be able to tell myself. Exactly. And I think that's really important. If you're the sonographer and you are recording something for somebody else, you should one, tell them what you think and to really demonstrate in the video as best as possible what you think. Because when we're not in the room, we're completely reliant on your pictures and videos. Yeah. Yes. So in the context of we know that there's endo already, I wouldn't be surprised if there were some adhesions with this ovary. Mm -hmm. But to me, um, I agree, this video is not super easy to interpret. I had a better sense of mobility on this ovary when I was there. Yeah. But one of the things that I look at as a bit of a soft marker is the, um, the border of the ovary and how strong or how vague that mm. border is if i see really crisp lines around the ovary to me that says probably less likely that we're gonna have adhesions um and sometimes it's very blurred so when it's very blurred yes. i'm a bit more concerned yes and those are the times where i'm like oh my god this is so hard it's mm -hmm. all it's the people with the worst endometriosis and it all starts to blend in and 
I feel it's it's hard. It's it's challenging. Yeah. But absolutely. exactly what you're saying, it's blurred and that makes sense. It's because mm -hmm. it's spilling out into the adhesions. Exactly. Yeah. The borders are not clear because the structures are all stuck to each other. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move on from that ovary. We got some cine loops. All right. Now we're implementing some more dynamic tests here. We got the sliding sign. It's funny. Sometimes you see things more clearly when you're not intending to look at it. I feel like that myometriosis is just popping out really nice. Yeah, look at that cyst. That like, right, this is right there. Um, can you repeat because it was breaking up? Can you repeat the mobility because I did not see it was like jagged because it was yeah. stopping. Oh, it's very annoying. So in this uh, in this dynamic clip here, our uh, sonographer is implementing the sliding sign. Uh, and I think they're using both the probe movement and the hand movement because you see a bit of activity up here anterior and you see the activity happening down here. But focus the eyes on that interface there on the posterior uterine serosa and the contents, the bowel behind it. What do you think of that? Um, I see a nice line there, nice serosa. Um, I'm I'm not seeing anything yet. Hello, I'm wondering what's right there where you just put your little yeah um, yeah. Do you think it's sliding or not sliding? I I couldn't tell because the clip kept freezing. You were freezing, so can you play it again for me? Is it not playing right now? Oh no, it's not playing. <laughs> oh, it's playing on my end. Oh no, no, it's totally am, frozen. Am I, All I see I see I see your white little arrow moving around, but. Nothing's moving, except okay. for that, your white arrow. No, okay. totally just a still image when I have the myometrial cyst right smack in the middle. You don't see now I'm going back to the ovaries. Mm -mm. I still, oh, now it's starting to move. Okay, okay. now you're going to the over. Now it, it woke up. Okay, all right, good. So now show me. So we have the sliding sign being implemented here. I think it looks, yeah, it's looking good there. Yeah. So the area that I was concerned about was just uh, nothing. So in this case, uh, I think we have really nice sliding yep. there, right? Yes, yes. If you look here, it's not as nice in terms of like a really dramatic um, separation between the structures, but you can see very subtle movement all the way along the posterior uterine serosa yep. there. Yep. So I think yeah. it's good. And I think in this case, we have the clear depiction of Adeno. No endo is jumping out at me in this particular oh. video yet, but Same let's here. get into the posterior compartment. Yes. Okay. So clearly wow. we have the intention wow. here to look at the right uterus sacral ligament. Yes. And you've already got something right there. So in this clip here, I think the ovary is over here, right? Yep. Where do you see something here? I'm I'm seeing like, the cell here as normal here. So what's going on right under the at the top? Here? No, up more higher. Here. This region here. Oh, there's the endometrioma, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. So we have the endometrioma here. That's a blood okay. vessel, I think. Yeah. And uh, there's the uterosacral, but what's like anterior to the uterosacral? What's the hypochoic? In the, right under where the, the probe. vaginal probe. Let's see. How would I show it to you? Right where, right here. Nope. Go up there. Left. That's, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually. So, um, if anybody's noticing, there's a bit of a hypoechogenicity here. I think there's a bit of a problem with my probe right now, and so we're getting that sorted. Oh, okay. So don't get too distracted by that. Uh, okay. Audience. Okay. Um, Otherwise, here. the uterosacral looks fine there. Yeah. Yeah. So. Most of the time when we're looking for USL endo, we're looking next to where the oma is because that's often where they're stuck. So that's usually where the region is going to be. I see vessels here. Yeah. They're very anechoic, yep. right? And yes. along this plane, I'm seeing normal USL, essentially. Um, so I'm not, nothing is jumping out at me okay. as overtly okay. abnormal here, but yep. um, but we'll keep going yep. and keep seeing what we see. So we're coming across now to the left. So the cervix just popped into view there. For the audience, it's really important to know that the probe is sitting in the posterior vaginal fornix behind the cervix. So we're really stretching out that posterior yeah. compartment. 
We're getting yes. a lot of bowel views here as well, which we'll come to more yep. specifically in a bit. But nothing is jumping out at me as yeah, we that's looking the lab. that looks normal. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a little bit more of a an attempted precise picture of the USL. You can see sort of this fan here. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's nothing that's within. That'll be a vessel. It would mm -hmm. uh, it would be more at the surface if we're talking about an endometriosis deposit, mm -hmm. not completely circumferentiated by normal hyperechoic USL. Yeah. Okay. So then we've taken a little uh, a, a sort of a step back. The zoom is out now, and we're looking at the bowel here. So yep, uterus is here. Ball. We're in the posterior fornix. What are you thinking? Anything? Now, so far, it's looking fine. Yep. You expect to see a nice black line. Uh, hypoechoic is the muscularis of the bowel wall oh oh are you zoomed up a lot no we're pretty zoomed out right now because uterus is here uh uterine vessels are here bowel is just coming on either side on this more of a little bit lateral we're pretty high up now to the level of the fundus okay. where the rectosigmoid is yep. so to oh, me, the, bowel, the, okay. the yep. bowel is looking normal in this yep. Uh, in this yep patient. yep that's uterus yeah yep. yeah it looks good yeah. So when I find the bowel up to the level of the fundus of the uterus, and I haven't seen any endometriosis deposits in the bowel lower, you could try and follow it even higher to the level of the sigmoid. And, and you should try as best as possible to follow it. But the likelihood of there being an isolated nodule up at that level is much lower, in which case you might say, I've done what I need to do. I don't yeah. see any endo. Yeah. So I might have come into the scan at this point. So that's maybe why we've gone back here. And uh, and one of the techniques that I really try and implement, and it's only recent that I've been putting a bit more of a, a word to this, but I actually do a lot of release. So I apply some pressure and I do a release move where I try and let the fluid fill spaces to highlight surfaces, because that's where endo affects uh, the pelvis most is the surface before it starts yeah. to infiltrate. So cervix is here. This is the vagina. There's a little bit of a fold there, and you can see a little bit of gel in the vagina. Okay. This is the posterior. Uh, this is the peritoneum overlying the back of the vagina. Okay. And do you see this area right here? Yeah. I'll pause. See that right there, that interruption? With the hyperechoic focus right there? It almost looks like a the same feature in some ways as like oh, a right there. Process, yeah. right? Is that what you, when you, the superficial endo that you've been identifying that yeah. I had that I have not even tried, but I do do that technique for the triangle sign is I'll push in for a retroverted uterus, which I've been teaching everyone, Amazing. Dr. Leonardi's triangle sign. And then you have to pull back so that the fluid can fill the space. So I'm going to try this. Yeah. I see that little area. Right. And when you do the triangle sign, do you ever pick up subtle things on the back of the uterus or on the on the peritoneum, like filmy adhesions or? Uh, you know what? I've just been focusing on seeing the triangle, so now I'm going to take a closer. And I'm always teaching someone. I either have residents or because right, like you taught your sonographers. Um, so I'm going to take a look. But yeah, I saw what I saw what you're looking at there. Right. So these interruptions should not be here. The peritoneum should be crisp. Now, of course, there are vessels, right? Every spot in the body is vascularized. And so uh, when we're more lateral, closer to the uterosacral ligaments, we start to see a little bit more of a vascularity, which is where the vaginal vessels are and the uterine vessels come in. But we're very central right now, and we shouldn't really be seeing a, a vessel. But if we think something could be a vessel and it's got an anechoic center to it, we should be able to follow it in some ways. There should be like a bit of a snake-like tortuosity to it. This is not. And the last clip we saw the sort of start to it and the end of it. We could see it start and end. So to me, this is superficial endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And that there, we're implementing the pushing, the jiggle test, yeah. because sometimes these hyperechoic areas, they jiggle in the peritoneal fluid. That's oh. there. Let's see. Okay, so... Um, clearly, you know, I've probably, uh, either gotten bored, went on to something else because we jumped to the ureters and, uh, and we'll come back to the posterior compartment in, the, in a few, I think, but, um, here we have a ureter, right? 
Uh, you're not there. I think now you do. I feel like your video is a few seconds behind for me. Now I see the order. Yeah. Now I went to the. Yep. Hopefully this recording will be successful. <laughs> I know because it's a little jumpy the way I'm seeing it. It's not like smooth. Yeah, I wonder because I've just been doing these on my own so far, so it's not trends. Yeah, maybe it's you know, too much. Day. We'll just... see. I am curious to see. Yeah, so there's the ureter. So we have the ureter here, and uh, and so what um, what I haven't shown here is how to find the ureter, and we'll do another video on that. But uh, but essentially, the ureters are quite lateral in the pelvic sidewall, and you can sort of see if I zoom up here, you can see the wall of the ureter. Yep. It usually is a little bit more on the uh, anechoic side interior. And uh, especially when the fluid is coming through, you see that very clearly. See, that's a bit more anechoic there. Yeah. We have the uterine vessels here. So it's going to be crossing just underneath those uterine vessels in this region here. And so finding it above that uterine is really the most important from an endo standpoint, since parametrial endometriosis usually blocks ureters at this level. So oh, okay. Looking, that's good to know. Yeah. If you're only seeing the distal ureter here, it, it can be a bit misleading because you see it's normal caliber. It's not very dilated yeah. and it's usually not very dilated there. So it's uh, it's going to be at this level or above. So I try really hard to follow it and to teach my team when it vermiculates at max dilation is when you can try and follow it up along that pelvic sidewall into the more proximal ureter region. So you're going to show us how far you try to follow it out? So in this video, no, it doesn't seem like it. Um, Was that far enough, though, for to look yeah. for the money shop, basically? Yeah, I think so. And okay. uh, and the other good news in, in this particular case is we haven't seen any large posterior compartment uterosacral ligament yeah. nodules. So I have a lot lower threshold of concern when there's no deep endo in the posterior compartment because what's going to, it's very, very rare to have an isolated parametrial nodule without a bowel nodule or without a USL nodule. So I'm not too worried about it. All right. So I have probably either I grabbed the probe before and then I moved to the ureters and came back, or maybe this is when I grabbed the probe, but I, I really wanted to explore this plane more because there's an endometrioma and almost always there is a site of endo near that endometrioma. Mm -hmm. Yep. But, you know, I'm clearly exploring this here and I don't see movement. There's definitely adhesion plane here and look yeah. how thin it is, right? Yes. But I'm not seeing a nodule. Maybe there's a little bit of a irregularity here, a little bit of a hypoecogenicity. But to me, this isn't screaming nodule per se. Yeah. So let's see. So, you know, I, I clearly I couldn't find anything. So I moved on. There's a nice uterosacral ligament picture, a little bit less pressure than before. There it is, in another the other side. Oh, I, I know, nice I'm just more clear on the same side. I'm not as good as annotating uh, as my team members. So this is are. the left uterosacral, right? Uh, probably is the left because there's no oma in the in the view endometrioma there, so it's probably the left. And then I found this, which is a. Uh, I think this is different than what I found before. Actually, it's the right. So oh. where. Uh, we're ah. seeing the ovarian endometrioma probably because it's stuck up a lot higher than usual, which is probably also why I didn't think that there was a nodule associated with it. Yeah. So, oh, I so your there machine here. actually has our machine. How do you have that come up? That's a measurement in your. Yeah. You make you can make them. Oh. Yeah. I'm gonna have to have our apps person make them. Yeah, for so sure. I don't always have to put right, left, you know, say yeah. Yeah, because I'm That's awesome. We're all a little bit lazy. Yeah. So if I can have uh, the the annotation built into the measurement with the calipers, then that's uh, that's a little bit it's easier. Beautiful. Me, right. And well, it makes it more clear. So this is in your calculations package. When you hit calculation or measure, yeah, different options come up. Exactly. That, and I built bowel, bowel endo, USL endo, okay. vagina. So yeah, all those are there. Oh. That is awesome. Okay. Okay. So then I found something else here. And yeah. this one I have not labeled with L or RUSL. So may, to me, this probably means, and we'll see a cine loop in a second, I think, this probably means that it's very central, in which case, and I haven't created this calc package yet, I call this essentially pouch peritoneum, which is uh, just on the other side of the vagina. So we see the vagina there. We see the vagina in transverse here. This is just in the peritoneum. So 
you know, does this meet the criteria for deep endometriosis or not? This is very controversial, but there is a, a nodule here. There is a depth of infiltration. It's only 1.3 millimeters, but there's something. So it is mm, probably appropriate to call this deep endo uh, rather than superficial endo. And mm -hmm. from a surgical standpoint, even though I'm an excision surgeon I, and you know, there's very uh, little utility in ablation, certainly the more depth of infiltration, the less ablation should be even uh, thought of. And really it should just be, we're taking this lesion out via excision. So there you go. Way more clear in the cine, right? Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Just saw it go by. Yes. Pause that. And there you see it. Yeah. There. Yeah. And that's where that USL, I think that's the right side. That's what we probably saw what I measured as our USL endo earlier. That's the OMA. Not a good view of it, but that's where it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So right... And then central is that one. And then that's coming to sort of the left side. Left yeah. US is not quite in there. So yeah, I, I, that's clear evidence of endo. Yeah. yeah. And then I'm likely here playing more with that fluid, trying to bring it into that space, mm -hmm. trying to see more subtle things. All right, I think we're coming to the end. I don't have the... the uh, annotations on to know which image we're on, but I think we're coming to the end. What about, do you take a picture of the bladder base and the anterior cul-de-sac to make sure, so you would have looked at, because that's part of our protocol. We make sure we look at that. Yeah, absolutely. Bladder implants. Yeah, yeah um, I, I, we don't, uh, we don't seem to have the greatest saved bladder photo in this series here, um, but, but oh, you would have looked, looked at, at. It. yeah. yeah. Every time I'm looking at the ureters, we start central in the bladder. We do the bladder at yeah. the end. So some of the urine has accumulated because everybody empties the bladder before the mm -hmm. vaginal scan. So we start at central in the bladder, sweep side to side on the bladder, and then ureters. It's routine, even though it's lower yield when, uh, when again, there's no deep endometriosis or in this case, there is still technically some deep endometriosis in that posterior compartment, but it's very, very small deposits mm -hmm. of endometriosis. So not so worried about the ureters, as I said earlier, but definitely we have a sonographic diagnosis of endo. We have an endometrioma. Yeah. We have a few other small deposits of endometriosis. Fortunately, the bowel is preserved. The bladder is preserved. The ureters are preserved. There's no obliteration of the pouch. Yeah. There is going to be adhesions with that endometrioma along the sidewall, but no. it's not the most severe case of endo, which is good. Uh, so, you know, that's important in the surgical decision-making should this patient pursue surgery. Um, the diagnosis of adenomyosis is also really important to that. So, uh, do you have any final thoughts? Maybe what I'll do is I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen. So our faces pop up here. Any uh, thoughts on the case? So how long is your, uh, typical scan? How long was that scan? The for patient, that patient? Was booked for 30 minutes. And okay. obviously some are going to be more complex than others. Mm -hmm. Some will sometimes take more than 30 minutes and some take less. Yeah. Uh, I can, uh, can try to tell you how long this scan took me. So and the sonographer starts it though, right? Like that's what we do in our practice. Like they start it. So this one with me going in the room started at 1214 and ended at 1238. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. That, and that's probably how our, it would be for us because yeah. they do the transabdominal, then they go and they empty their bladder. Then the sonographer starts, gets me the routine measurements. And then I come in and then we kind of look through all the, the, the areas where you want to look at the bladder, yeah. the ureters, the rectal wall, the posterior cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And eventually yeah. I'm, I'm trying to gear up where the sonographers have enough skill, enough uh, confidence to be able to do these independently. Because if we yeah. believe that prevalence of endometriosis is around 10%, maybe higher. And of course, the prevalence of pelvic pain, which might be other things, is going to be much higher than 10%. It's the most common indication next to abnormal uterine bleeding for us. And if it's just going to be with 
you know, held by these sinologists who are the only people that can do the scan, then we're never going to be able to attend to right. the volumes, right? So we exactly. have to, be able to train up others. Yes, yes. And that's what we're doing in our practice too. The, the main issue is you do need experience like we were talking about, right? Like you, the more you see, and that's ultrasound in general, right? The more ultrasound you do, the better you get. And the directed ultrasounds for endometriosis, you need experience. So it does take a while, but it's it's definitely worth learning. I mean, our patients are so grateful. Yeah, absolutely. They get an answer. They get the right surgery by the right surgeon. It's, yes. Yeah. We're, we're in the we're in like the, the modern day of endometriosis diagnosis and, and we're getting better in management because we're getting so much better with diagnosis. So. Right. And standardizing me. things. So the studies are better. And um, so I just want to put a plug in, which I'm sure you also would agree is use the standardized terms for adenomyosis, like start using, you know, get the Musa paper. I'm pretty sure it's free. Yeah. Um, and um and look at lectures by people like us um and uh yeah and start using those terms so that the studies just get better and better yeah we'll get there thanks for yeah. joining me Yvette. this was fun oh, this was so fun you were my first special guest Yay! on uh, me and my cats <laughs> yes and your cats get reporting with you yes in this case All it's right. reporting with us uh, and so uh, hopefully we'll have uh, you back another time, maybe joined okay. with, uh, with Lori as well, our, yes, our third co-founder, the Gus team. And uh, and we'll hopefully have other special guests as well on yes. recording with me. It's been a pleasure. And hopefully this was a, a great episode for all of you. See you next time. Bye.